Oops, no, we'll do that. Start recording. Okay, let's do this, shall we? <laughs> Hi, welcome to um, today's Self Love Revolution chat. My name is Barry Selby, and I'm glad you're here. And the topic today is uh, getting your house in order. And I didn't really know what I was going to talk about when I wrote the title out, but now I've had a chance to sit with it. I've got a clarity now. So, um, what I'm going to go through actually is five particular areas using the letters of house, kind of obvious, to give you some keys to functionally and effectively have your life work more smoothly, gracefully, and joyfully. That's the plan anyway. So if you haven't seen me do any talks before, I should probably introduce myself with my title and everything else, because you may or not know who I am. So I'm one of the only guys, one of the only men in this group. Um, my name is Barry Selby. Um, me and I have been friends for 15 years now. Ooh. It's like in the mid, mid early 2000s, in the aughts, we met. Um, and back then, we actually, we, we lived locally to each other. And at that time we met, we had two, two parallel brands. She was the fashion muse. I was the fashion consultant. So we became fast friends. So that's so how we met back in like 2007, eight, somewhere around there. Um, and so she's always had me as a, as a friend. We've collaborated on a couple of books. We've worked together in different projects. And so she's invited me one of the speakers in the self-love revolution, one of the only men she trusts in here, which is I take with great privilege. So I'm thankful for that. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a best-selling author, inspirational speaker, spiritual guide, and love and relationship expert, teacher, guide, and coach. I had the word coach personally. And so normally I'm working with people, particularly women, helping attract the right relationship. But what I've been discovering over the last, well, it's been always been there, but the last four or five years, is that my focus really is helping my clients learn to love themselves. Because every relationship out there can only work effectively when you love yourself first. So I've become more blatant about that and put that as my front and center speaking focus on how do you support yourself, how do you care for yourself, how do you handle all these stuff that shows up and become more effective at your own, um, to become your best self. So today's topic, again, is, put it, is put getting your own house in order. And I'm going to go through the letters of house to give you some keys you can work with and use in your life. So the first one is, as in house, H, is, the, is um, sorry, the letter H, word, but yeah, letter H. I'm going to call it health as a general topic, but the subtitle is honesty. And the reason I'm saying it is because one of the things that I believe we need to do more often than we have done in the past is be really real with ourselves to be honest and to be caring about how we take care of ourselves. So I'm not talking necessarily about physical health. I'm really focusing more on the emotional and mental health that we don't always do for ourselves. For example, um, if you've ever had any judgments in your life, that's a detriment to your emotional or mental health. If you've ever had any grudges or anger or upset with other people, that's detrimental to your emotional health. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have those, but my, what I'm going to talk about is how do you work with transform and change those so you have a better relationship with yourself so when it comes to um i'm gonna go about this let's start with judgment it's the most it's easy one to start with i've talked about this i did a talk in the group last month last month i think it was about judgment and forgiveness and I, i've done that quite a few talks about that so in in cliff notes version because i don't want to go back and read the whole talk again we carry, there are four, I, I call it, the, I think I call it the four horses of the apocalypse, which is blame, shame, judgment, and sorry, blame, shame, resentment, and guilt, which are all based around judgment. And when I talk about health, what I'm really speaking about is how do you deal with stuff that shows up? Because in life, we tend to get into judgment once in a while. We tend to find ourselves blaming or feeling shame, or we judge, or we have guilt or resentment, any of those things. The key is, though, how long do you stay there? And how quickly or how willingly do you say, you know what, I don't want to hold on to that anymore. And so forgiveness is one of the tools I use and I've, I've offered it before. And if you didn't get that last time, you can message me or reach out to me and get the forgiveness worksheets that I use that I've, I've developed over the last several years of my own work. You can have those. Um, I will follow up and ask you how you deal with them, by the way, just, you know, I don't just give them out and say, go do your own thing. I do say how they work to kind of make sure you get value from them, but also being aware in the first place is one of the biggest keys. I've talked about this in my work, in my coaching, that the first step to this journey is becoming aware. And so oftentimes we run autopilot on our mental, mental thoughts and our emotional feelings. 
And oftentimes we, we don't realize we've been judging people for the last three weeks and not even realize we've been doing it. So being aware of it's the first step. And when you are aware of the discord inside, then you can do something about it. And here's the thing. When you become aware of the discord inside, you don't start judging it as wrong because it's, it's already, that's adding more um, like self-flagellation. It doesn't work. The focus is to really say, okay, been doing that, let's stop it now and do something different. So the first piece I want to speak to is really about how do you create more emotional mental health inside your body, which means shifting the focus from negative emotions and negative thoughts to positive ones. Now, before I go too far down the road, I was having a conversation with somebody in, in Clubhouse about this, about the people who believe in high vibes only. Like, you know, it's like very Pollyanna. Ouch. Thank you, Anna. Um, that when you are in high vibes only, it's ignoring the negative. So I'm not talking about ignoring things. What I'm talking about is how do you handle, deal with, resolve those negative things, again, emotions or thoughts, so you can then stick, stay more in the positive direction. So, because the high vibe people are generally like ignoring all the negative and just going the positive. And that's not what we're talking about here. Because if you're avoiding it, that's simply stifling it and suppressing it. And that's not what we're about, about being aligned to your health and healthy, healthy self image, healthy self respect comes from having a clear um, internal process and a clear internal stat, state of being. So, first one is I'm talking about is health. And by the way, if you have questions along the way, please you know, be put your hand up or message or talk into the, in, speak into the conversation because I'm giving you this structure, but I know there's going to be peace on this. I trust that. So, so again, first one is, um, is health. Second one we'll jump into, and I'll go back, I may go back and forth on these because some of these do tie in together because it is meant to be a structure. The second one is O in, in house, which is really what I call ownership. The other word I would use for this, which is not an O word, is responsibility. And the way that one of my teachers put it is responsibility is two words. It's the ability to respond. And I, again, talked about this in one of the previous talks about how we oftentimes get caught up in reactionary states and we just, we don't even think about it. We're already jumping down somebody's throat when they say something versus holding a space saying, hmm, do I want to respond to that or not? That's the power of ownership. Because we, and I say this in a nice way, <laughs> we're not trained with or raised with teachings that teach us how to own our own feelings or own our own reactions or responses or interactions with the world. One of the biggest things I watch people do, especially when they're watching the news and the media, is they tend to react negatively to it, whether it's the channel they like watching and they get, they get um, indignant, or they're watching a different news channel that is opposing their views and they get reactive to it. Now, that's not everybody's thing, but that's an example of what happens. We are tenderly provoked. If you're driving on the freeway, especially you live in Los Angeles like I do, driving on the freeway, there's tendencies to be um, reactive to traffic <laughs> because it happens in LA and other parts of the world as well. So taking responsibility and taking ownership is where you basically get to be self um, I want to use the word navigating in my own context. Is, is how do you navigate the world from a place of centeredness? If you notice when you look at like Google Maps or Apple Maps, it shows you on the map where you are, you know, you are here type thing. But oftentimes we spend our time outside of that point, chasing around other things, reacting to other people's views, um, getting invested in things that aren't our business or need to worry about. So ownership means to be in your body, to live in your space, to own who you are. And from that place, you can be responsible for what happens. So when you're around other people, how you interact with them, how you um, don't get in other people's business is a good thing to have. And I know one of my bad habits in the past was to be overly interested in other people's stuff because what was happening for me was I was avoiding my own stuff because the other part of ownership is to notice my own internal, um, I want to use the word process, but it's so technical my own internal dialogue and thoughts and beliefs about myself because I was too busy worrying about other people. I wasn't even living in my own body. So again, like the you are here on the map is bringing you back to yourself. So ownership is a cornerstone of how to do all this work. And in the journey I've been on since, well, my first seminar was in 1984. So I've been on this work for a long time. From the very get go is about how do we live in our own body and take care of ourselves and be present to ourselves because that's where everything lives. 
we get so invested in how other people think of us, which, yes, I'm talking about that here, I'm watching my, my script. Um, we're so invested in what other people think of us, we never live in our own body. You know, it's like, live your life for you, not for other people. If you've been in long-term relationships where you spent your life worrying about somebody else, then you're not living in your own body. I did that many times. I know that with other people, I was in um, relationship with friendships, connections, business relationships, especially. I would do most to keep impressing them, making them think I was good, rather than just simply owning who I was. So understanding that this is the lesson that we all keep learning is how do we let go of trying to impress other people or make other people think of us a certain way and simply just say, you know what? I love myself. I care about myself. And I'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> in the script. So that's the second one. The third one, the you in, in, in house is understanding. And what I mean by understanding as well is, well, let me say it this way, because I'm really, there's like three things already coming up. I've been on spiritual paths for many years. And as I've been going through this journey and, and the deeper teachings I get, I start to have a different understanding of the way the world works. And I'm, I'm watching this. Sorry, there's two ways I'm going to use understanding. One of them is to basically have a bigger understanding of our own participation in the world. Now, if you have a spiritual practice, you know this yourself. If you don't, you may not. But understanding that as that we are, the way my, uh, from my background in, in psychology, we talk about how we're, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And for me, what this given me is a great deal of freedom. Because by understanding that I'm not just this physical presentation, that I'm more than this, I tend to have a more expansive, so what I use, expansive view of the world. Meaning that I've become better at not reacting, judging, blaming, because I see the world through a different lens. And that's been a gift that's come through this. And it's not from like, I have to be disciplined and focused all the time. It's just become part of my life. The other part of understanding I want to put on the table is, in a way, it's, I would call it self-support, because if you, if you flip the word the other way around, standing under, a lot of times what we don't do is actually stand in our own truth. We are swayed by other people's opinions, as I mentioned before. And so understanding is a form of trusting your own innate wisdom. Because being spiritual beings having a human experience, we can tap into a deeper knowing that we may not really believe we've already had. In fact, oftentimes in my talks, well, many times in my talks, I have no script because I trust something coming through is bigger than me. We all have a resource to that. I'm not saying I'm the only one. I have friends of mine who tap into incredible truth that I haven't got access to yet. But we all have that innate wisdom. You know when you have conversations, a part of you will go, I, a part of you goes, I wish I'd said something then. Or I knew I should have said this instead of that. That's the recognition. It is, it is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely the wonderful thing about hindsight is we'll say something and go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said this. So understanding is almost a sense of pacing yourself. I mean, one way of looking at it is when you're understanding yourself, you can actually say, you know what, before I respond, again, respond versus react, let me sit with what was said and then choose how and respond to that. So understanding, standing under yourself, meaning Putting your feet underneath your own being is a way of giving yourself time and trusting yourself to have the right response. So that's, that's number three. Again, I'm going to come back to all these different ways and mesh them all together. Um, the S in self-care, so sort of the S in house is self-care and support. They're all, I mean, all of these things I'm talking about come back to the same thing also, which is centering on you, self-support, self-centeredness in a good way and resources. But when you have self-care as a priority, you put yourself first. And I know some people look at being spinning yourself first as being egotistical, and I don't mean that at all. What I'm talking about is how do you take care of yourself on all levels so that you say no to certain things you don't want to do anymore. You say yes to things you do want to do. You take time out for yourself to nurture yourself when things get stressful. You notice when you're getting stressful and you say, hang on a second, I need to take care of myself. All of these pieces are what I would call under the umbrella of self-care. And I said support as well, because the more you put more focus on taking care of yourself so you can be more effective in the world, the more you can actually support yourself. And again, understanding all these things tied together, because when you are supporting yourself, 
which you can do. You don't need other people to support you as a priority. Yes, it's nice to have other people's support. And I can go in a whole different direction about codependency, which I've talked about before as well. But when you recognize that you support yourself, then when other people support you, it's a bonus. It's especially in a relationship, romantic relationship. Um, I've talked about this before as well, that relationships are 50-50, the 100-100. But we get in this belief system because we're trained this way that the other person has to make things good for us. Now that happens in business as well as in romantic relationships. But when you learn or when you remember, excuse me, to support yourself, which means to give yourself over to yourself and you're, you're 100% who you are and you're supporting who you are, then when you're in a relationship, that person can add to your relation, yourself and can be, um, it's like the way I describe it, relationship is relationship is again, it's 100 and 100. It's, it's the, that, that I'm whole and complete as I am. If somebody comes into my life, they can add to that, but they don't fill any gaps that I have. That's the thing about self-care and support is you have wholeness in your life. Now I'm giving you cliff notes on a lot more work I do in my, in my coaching work, but this is a key piece is that when you stand on your own two feet, and you own your self-expression, your self-support, your self-reliance, then you don't need somebody else to make you feel whole. But many of us have been trained to think that you won't be complete until you meet somebody else. Not true. You are complete as you already are. And the last one in this, which I wanted to put on the table so we can go back and circle around, the E, I'm calling expression. Expression meaning speaking your truth, meaning standing up for yourself, meaning being the champion of your own voice so this one is kind of out in the world so to speak so rather than all the other stuff being internal this is external it also means that you ask for what you want in your relationships in your business dealings in your friendships be bold enough be honorable enough and be honest enough to ask for what you want in all your relationships because if if i'm sure i'm not the only one i've sometimes put up with things in past relationships and friendships where i didn't actually take up my own space and I didn't ask for what I want in the relationship. It was all lopsided. So expression means to not hold back your voice, to speak your truth and to say what is true for you in your relationships. And yes, by doing so now, let me back up a second, saying it with care for yourself first. So you're not just yelling at people because I don't want to have you, you know, shouting at people and telling people off, but self-expression meaning that you're really, speaking your truth from a place of ownership. I feel this way, I desire this, I choose this, versus you're doing something wrong or you should do something better, all these different judgments again, because that's back to what we said earlier. So expression means to really speak from your own ownership of who you are and start being amazed by what you get back because you might discover you get back a lot more than you ask for. Good things, I mean, by the way. So. At the same time, you may start losing or letting go of certain connections, friendships that no longer serve you because they've been taking from you all this time because you never asked what you wanted. So expression for me is about being willing to speak into that relationship to ask what you want, but also in a way create new boundaries. Because for many of us, boundaries are a new thing. I was in a, um, I've been on Clubhouse a lot the last few, last few weeks and there was a conversation a couple of days ago, we talked about boundaries. Because people didn't know, some people in the room didn't know what they were, didn't know how to create boundaries for themselves emotionally or, or verbally. And so they were getting a steamroll by their partners. So expression is being able to say, you know what, this is, this is not fair. This is where I, I call the line. I'm taking my own space up. I want to have this, this connection. I'm going to have this communication in the relationship. So that's expression. So giving you a bunch of stuff really quickly, and that was the five keys I was talking about in, in the house, so to speak, in your house in order. Um, and this is, again, this is just the, the top of the, uh, sorry, the tip of the iceberg. So I'd love to invite your questions, thoughts. If you want to go deeper, which one would, would you want me to speak to more? I would welcome your interaction. Joy. Wow, I have, a, I have a comment and a question. Um, I just <laughs> had a, a, a session with my coworker. I'm going back to work. I'm working right now, but I'm working from home and I have to go back to my office, work from my office on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a coworker who is a bully. Uh, she harasses people. Um, she's, um, she's, she's violent and she gets away with it. And so I said, I'm not, I'm, this is it. 
I, I'm not doing this anymore. And so yesterday I wrote an email to my coworker outlining some of the behaviors and um, what I would like to do about it. And she said, okay, well, I'll join you and let's go talk to our director. So this morning we just had another, we, we talked about it this time. And so I was writing down notes and then, and she said, well, I don't feel comfortable with talking to our supervisor about all of this and outlining all of this. I said, well, we, this is how you do it. You have to ask for what you want. If you don't, if I, I said, well, if we can't, if I can't give a timeline of when I would like some of this addressed, if I can't say the behavior and I, I need this change because I, otherwise like, this is a sick environment. I, I refuse to work mm -hmm. in this environment, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, so my coworker said, no way, I'm not comfortable with saying that. I can't give that. That sounds like an ultimatum. I said, well, it's not really an ultimatum, but it's like a boundary. I'm going to tell her that I refuse to work in this kind of workplace. And then I said, and we also have, it says in big, bold letters when you walk in, zero tolerance to violence. I said, right there is the backup. <laughs> That's our backup. That's what we can use. And yeah. I'm going to say, okay, look at that sign. It says, we have a zero tolerance to violence. So I'm talking about lateral violence, bullying behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is the other backup that we have in all of our meetings. This is what happens. And I'm giving concrete evidence. I'm not making it up. I'm not imagining it. I'm not on some other planet trying to say something's happening and it's not. And I'm outlining, okay, on this date, this is what this person did. On this date, this is also what happened. On another meeting, this is what happened. And I've charted it and I have the dates. And now how can, how can that be denied? And so this fits because what you're saying is exactly what I'm going to be doing next week. So thank you very much for affirming and um, for clarifying. And this is, I'm gonna show all this to them. If you don't believe me, <laughs> this is what Barry says. No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, and, and the fact that the, the sign on the front door states what it is that you're talking about. I mean, let's, let's be clear about this. In business environments, not everybody does um, mean what they say. And then like, you know, they actually speak louder than words. So I would definitely recommend that you bring to them awareness that the mission, so to speak, of the company is about nonviolence, is about being able to communicate without being threatened. And the fact that in the very office of that company, there is the opposite of that is, is undermining the very business the company is doing. I mean, it's, it's detrimental to the business success. On the other side, just another piece as well, just to enter that conversation, no job should require you sacrificing your own self-esteem. No job should take you, absolutely, probably, yeah, violence is not only physical, no, violence is definitely often mental and emotional too. Um, the threat level, I mean, I, I, I just, just as a sidebar, I, I was bullied in high school uh, for about five years by other boys, but I only got hit maybe three times over five years. It was the, it was the, it was the emotional mental threat that kept me in fear. So. I know definitely how bullying is not just physical by any means. I mean, physical presence, yes, because there were five guys and I was the only one. So, yeah. So just back to, to say what, what so Jeremy's talking about. It's tempting sometimes, and I did it in my early 20s, to be in jobs that were, I put before my own self-support self because I wanted the paycheck. And so I'll be so caught up in the job, like I, I was in, I was in, in um, um, lack consciousness because I was afraid that if I'd lost this job, I wouldn't have something else. And so I put up with bad behavior. I put up with sometimes heinous behavior because I wanted the paycheck. So be clear that your self-support, that your um, ownership of your own space is that sometimes you're going to say, you know what, I need to leave this job because I deserve to be respected in the work I do. So I'm not saying that's what Joanne has to do, but certainly be willing to, as she's doing, just speaking to the boss, wise choice, and know that there are options as well. That's not the only thing that can happen. Because if they say that this person is going to stay, you don't have to put up with it, ultimately. You know, that's, that's a different choice, and that's the next level. It's like, you, first step is this, but no, there may be other things after that. If, the, if your supervisor doesn't take your feedback, then what's the next thing to do after that? So just be aware of that. Yeah, we have a plan of all of the things that we can suggest of um, some resolution, some 
some solutions and, and stuff like that for our workplace. So that's, that's the other part we're going to do. And I, I was going to, I was going to suggest a timeline that um, right now we're doing our performance appraisals by the end of June. So this is the time that the supervisor can address all of this. And so um, I'm going to say, so by the end of June, you know, you're going to meet with all of us and, and I, I'm saying it now so that you can bring this up with the, with my coworker and all of us. And then by October, I hope to see some changes uh, with, with all of this. And if there is no changes, then I'm going to take next steps. There you go. Because there has to be some kind of timeline, otherwise it can be put put under the carpet for for however long. Because it, it nobody can she won't address it, right? Because that's what's happening right now. It doesn't get addressed. Yeah. And I think the fear factor is a big thing. Like Barry saying, like when you want you're afraid to lose your job. That's when people balk. And the person who was supporting you was like, oh my god, I could lose my job. So then they become quiet, and that's another form of like being bullied, just that threat yeah. of not having your paycheck and, and being fired over somebody else. Well, we're all in a union, so we're not, I'm not losing my job. Neither is that yeah. other co-worker. We're not, we're not scared to lose. I'm not scared to lose my job. By mm -hmm. right. no. I'm, I'm not scared at all. But I, yeah. um, but I, I, what I do know is I'm not working in that kind of an environment and there has to be some changes. And then if there aren't any changes, then, then I'll make some decisions later on. Yeah. Wise woman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, as we said earlier, it's not just about romantic relationships, <laughs> it's also about work relationships. So, <laughs> perfectly illustrated. So, any other questions, thoughts so far on this, this conversation? No? You're good? I did actually oh. do have one. Like, um, we're talking about like taking your care of yourself on all levels, but when you have somebody with a chronic illness and they can't take care of themselves and they have to rely on somebody else to take care of them on a certain level or mo multiple levels, and then they're not being cared for in the way that they um, want to be and they express it, but it's still not being met. And, that, and I think that's very hard. Yes, and so a couple of things on that. Right. right. Um, I want to hear your thoughts about that. <laughs> <laughs> I understood. So, on the physical level, if the person who's doing the caretaking doesn't provide the care that the recipient needs, obviously a conversation might be had. And if it hasn't, if, it's, if you had the conversation and it's not been changed, maybe the person didn't understand it. But if they're refusing to change the level of care, Again, it's like sometimes you're going to make drastic choices. Maybe you need to find somebody else who can care for that person who has the skills. So that's one thing. The second part, which is the internal part, is, and I mentioned this before, it's about this, is the relationship we have with ourselves in our, in our hearts and our minds and our emotions. So our mental and emotional self-support is part of it too. So it's not just physical. So if that person is dealing with physical stuff, it's also the challenge is how do they keep their emotional mental state healthy? especially when you're dealing with a physical ailment that is de debilitating, it can be sometimes be tempting to feel depressed, to feel um, diminished, and to feel just basically out of control. I know some people, in fact, I remember a friend of mine when I was in um, this back in, well, 80s, he was, he was quadriplegic in an in electric, electric wheelchair, but his demeanor and his mental state was always so amazingly positive. And he had, you know, almost no physical capacity to do anything. And he had a caretaker, which was good. There was, there was, there was a healthy one. But his mental state, until the very end, because his body eventually gave out, but his mental and emotional state was so positive, so uplifting, it was almost a joy to be around him. So our internal mental and emotional state is not tied to our physical well-being. A lot of people think it is, which is the, which is the thing. When we can... And I mentioned before about having the spiritual understanding about spiritual beings having a human experience. When you can start seeing yourself as beyond the physical level, as in that your emotional state is not tied to your physical well being, then you're free. So that's a piece of it too. But yes, sure. if it's, sometimes they're not logistical things to take care of. So if, you, if it's someone who's deeply challenged physically and needs help, and the person who's helping isn't doing what needs needed, either cause corrective feedback so they can do things needed or get extra help or change the person helping. It's, it's, it sounds simple, but that's really what has to happen. 
have another question because we're talking about like you know, coming to a point of like responding rather than reacting. And that's, mm-hmm. it's very beautiful. Can you give us examples of, I mean, okay. Give us examples of tools to get a person from reactivity to responding. You're talking about doing it with somebody else or with yourself? Um, sometimes <laughs> with myself, but sometimes right? um, I'm, yeah, I'm good compared. I mean, like I used to feel like a lot more reactive when I was younger and, you know, but now like much better, but I, I would like to know more tools. Yeah. Like more tools right. like to be less reactive. Um, uh, I know like, and I'll just say again, when I feel more grounded, then I feel less like anybody else is going to bother me or be annoying to me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but sometimes in that moment, you know, because especially when you have like a post-traumatic stress disorder and all this other, you know, stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you give us some tools or, or suggest something that would be um, useful? Certainly. Um, the easiest one I would say, I mean, you know, they say, you know, if you're going to get angry, count to 10. There's methods that madness, meaning that if something is, because reaction is basically instantaneous. There's no thought, there's no ability to intercede before you're already doing something that is reactive. So anything you can do that can interrupt that, a pattern interrupt, a transformational moment, whatever it is, can help you be less reactive. So can, like having that chance to take a breath, I mean, one of my simplest things I tell my clients is like, you know, when something happens that's going to trigger you, you get upset, take a deep breath. Yeah. Because one, it changes your internal homeostasis and it brings you back to center. And secondly, it stops you saying something you may want to say. And so then you can respond. So if it's with somebody else, the same thing applies. If you're with somebody who's getting upset, ideally not at you, but you're not noticing getting out of whack, (laughs) is like, just say, it's like, you know, I notice you're getting a little bit, you know, jittery, upset. Take a breath. Let's breathe together. Let's be, let's take a moment to step down and just step it down so you can just respond differently. Yeah. Yeah. The other one can be, uh, and again, it depends on what your environment and what's happening, is take a walk. Because by taking a walk, removing yourself from the circumstance, because the other part is when you're in an intense moment, sometimes it's to change your physical space, like geographically, like literally go for a walk around the block or just take a walk around the house, can get you out of the state you're in because you've shifted your energy. Because oftentimes, and this is something from NLP, um, is that when you're in a particular state, sometimes you've got to physically move two or three steps from where you were physically standing to change your state. So by taking a walk and by doing things different than you were in, because you're in a certain posture, a certain energy, a certain breath, a certain place in that reactive moment, if you change any of that, you can interrupt it. So yeah. those are the two things you can use that can be functional. They're easy. I mean, there's a lot of deeper work you can do. You know, you can, you could, sorry, what, what was that? <laughs> sorry, I'm just thinking about, okay, like this is about my ex-husband. Like if we would have an argument, I would like, okay, I'm walking away. And I would walk away, he would follow me. <laughs> And ah, I was like, no, yes. you don't understand. I have to get away from you right now. And you would follow me. And I'm like, go away. But, so, the, so the thing is then, if that's the case, you might want to say to him, it's like, stay there, I'll be right back. Because he, needs, <laughs> he gets reassurance. Because a lot of times he's like, you're going, where are you going? You know, right. so, by, so you're sometimes you've got to give him. Away. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so having, having, I mean, it sounds simple, but it's almost like by letting somebody know, stay there, I'll be right back just to walk away without saying anything can be right. like what did i do you know right. so that can be, i mean that can be a pattern interrupt in a good way too however it can also be distressing the person who was talking because they're going they walked away from me what happened right but when, when you say like give me two minutes and you know i need to go to the bathroom or you can make an excuse whatever it is like just give me a moment i'll be right back then they can they can sit there because one thing is their um simmering may settle down a bit too yeah. so they can be the side effect as well yeah totally thank you Sure. Anyone else have any questions? No, she went to work. Could you just repeat the uh, the acronym again? What the word each acronym? Yes, word absolutely. Is again, please. Sure. Um, I was using as the topic is called getting a house in order. I use that as H O U S E. So the H is health, which includes having a sense of honesty with yourself. So there's double H on that one. O is ownership, which I put as as also includes responsibility. 
you is understanding or standing under yourself, supporting yourself and having understanding about things that are happening. S is self-care, which means support of yourself, taking care of yourself. And E is expression, being true to yourself, speaking your truth and being honest in your communication. Thanks. I'm going to reflect on them a little bit right here. Absol absolutely. Absolutely. And any questions, thoughts? Because I, I mean, that's the, the, the nutshell of the, the teaching this today. Um, can you speak a little bit more, expand a little bit more on the ownership aspect, the responsibility, yes. please? Um, this to me is, is really what what's transforms the trap of codependency. Uh, we talked about codependency before in many of my own, I've got a, a series on my website called Cracking the Codependency Code I did with a friend of mine, five five video series. Codependency is a trap we fall into with other people, usually romantically, but also with family, with siblings, with business partners as well. And codependency is this sense that, that the other person makes us feel okay, but the other person makes us feel complete, especially romantically. You know, Jerry Maguire, you complete me is the fav my favorite go-to quote for the epitome of codependency. Ownership is where you no longer need that. Ownership basically is, is almost like independence, but not quite as um, closed off as that. In, in, um, let me sidebar a bit and come back to this. In one of the, the teachings I follow, we talk about the evolution, evolution of relationship went from codependency to independence to interdependence. And to but break down a nutshell, codependence is where you can't live with the other, with the other person. The epitome, if you're old enough to remember, or if you watch it at Nick at Night, there was a show called All in the Family with, with Archie and Edith Bunker. That was a very codependent relationship. She was a meek housewife. He was the bossy goat, like the man of the house, but they couldn't live without each other. If she wasn't there, he would fall apart. My parents kind of epitomized that, so I know that model very well. That's codependency in a nutshell. Independence, especially after the, this is the point of relationship level, for women, independence happened after the sexual revolution in the 60s. Women, basically, for the first time since 1960, something onwards, got their own bank accounts, had their own cars, their own apartments, they had freedom. So they didn't need a man. Because before that, in the 50s and before that, women couldn't function, really, without having a man in their lives because the way society taught it. So women got independence, and then men had to be independent because they couldn't have their woman be depending on them. That wasn't really healthy either. So the relationship model I talk about and teach, and I'm learning to live myself, is what interdependence, because truly is, we don't need anybody else. However, the things that other people give us, they make it much easier. It's like we can't scratch our own back, for example, very easily, but somebody else can. As simple as that is something else can bring to us. So it's not that we can't live without them, but they add to our experience. So we're whole beings, human, fully expressing, fully being ourselves, and somebody can add to that. And that's really what that level of, um, of ownership is, is that we own ourselves. We are fully, um, autonomous is a fancy word, but we're fully embodying, embodying who we are. And so the responsibility piece I talked about in that is the ability that we can choose how we tend to act from that place. Because when we're codependent, then we're oftentimes in reaction because we want to maintain the codependency. That's why in, in relationships, oftentimes, especially if you're living in the old paradigm, that if somebody does something that upsets you, you want to fix it as quick as you can because you don't want to break that codependent safety. But when you're independent, sorry, interdependent, and you're whole and you own yourself, then you can respond in a place that's much calmer and more free because you're not needing that person to be a certain way. In fact, you're letting them, you're actually freeing them to be themselves as well. Does that give you some more clarity, Anna? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I was just thinking about, um, you know, I, I understand my part of it and what I need to work on in terms of being healthy and um, in terms of owning my aspect of I need to take care of my needs or whatever. What I find is, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on it or what suggestions you might have, I tend to be very, uh, you know, I tend to bear more on the side just by my nature, my, my, my makeup, um, like more kind of self-reliant and kind of independent, wanting to get things done. I don't tend to like to burden other people or ask for too much help or whatever. That part mm -hmm. I'm actually quite comfortable with. 
But what I find myself uncomfortable is that when people don't reciprocate that, I get really agitated. Like uh -huh. when I come across a personality who's much more needy and who wants my opinion about things or wants me to do this with them, wants me to go shopping with them, what should they do? Or constantly want to tell me about what they're feeling and how, you know, whatever their issues are. And I just get very intolerant about it. And I just like, I feel like in my mind, I said, just deal with your own stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to know your thoughts on that. I mean, I do want to live more loving and I do understand that I can open my heart a little bit more, but there gets to a point there. I feel that if I don't create the boundaries that are necessary, um, then I feel overwhelmed by them. Like I get overwhelmed, like almost like they bring me down. And then if they right. bring me down, then they're, they're not going to come to me anymore. So if they pull me down to where they are in terms of not feeling optimal, then I'm not going to be any good. And we're both kind of, you know, sinking in the water and there's no lifeguard around, right? So I was just I, yeah. wondering what your thoughts about how do I best deal or deal with that person in a way that I can still care for myself and yet be humane to them? Well, first of all, I understand that, you know, not everyone's at the same level because you're, you're, that was the thing you were saying. It's like, you know, you wish they would do the same things you would be independent, be, and that's, that's understandable. At the same time, you're not meant to save everybody either. So recognize that, yes, you are un, um, that you are less reliant than they are on people. But it doesn't mean you need to accommodate everybody to be loving. One of the biggest traps you fall into is that if I was being loving, I'd have to so, say yes to everybody. It's like, no. You can be loving when you say no as well. So um, I mentioned boundaries earlier in, in my talk. And part of this framework is learning how to have healthy boundaries with other people so that if that person is, I mean, if a person asks you once in a while for support and help and you can give it, great, no problem. But if somebody's consistently knocking on your door for help because you, they want you to basically run their lives for them, they need to get educated some other way. And maybe you can educate them or maybe you can refer them to a good book or a, maybe you should recommend them go see a coach or something like that, or some other resource they can go to other than you so they can get what they need. Because cutting them off without any guidance isn't necessarily loving either. But if you say that, you know, I, I can't focus on this right now, I need to take care of myself, or I've got to go do this thing, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But if you like, I recommend this book, or you might want to check out this person, or this website, or this YouTube video, because that would help you as well. And so it's, it's, a, it's not necessarily you want to cut them off cold, but it's also disengaging enough so you can have freedom again because it is it is loving to say no in fact no is one of the most loving things you can say to other people and yourself excuse me loving is one of the greatest things you can do for yourself to say no to other people and say it that way and so the confusion is some people think think saying yes is the only way you can be loving it's like no not true one of the most loving things you can do is say no because it then gives somebody a chance to grow on their own two feet it gives them the chance to have ownership Yeah, that's beautiful. That's helpful. I'm going to pause in case anybody else has anything to say. If nobody else has anything, I'm going to come back with another question. <laughs> I had you. a feeling you might have another one in there. Thank anybody you. else? Anybody else want to jump in before Anna comes back with more? I love Anna's questions. <laughs> <laughs> so you're all getting value from Anna's questions. That's great. <laughs> Thanks for that, Mermaid. I love that. Thank you. So Anna, I think there's nobody else competing with you for now, unless somebody else wants to join. I, I've had well, to I'd do like that to... in the past. I've had to, um, because I'm busy or I just don't want to, I'm trying to create a boundary and, and I don't want to get into a big song and dance about this is my boundary. Um, this is what I'm able to give and blah, blah, blah. Instead, I have said, okay, well, um, how about if you try looking at this or this is what I've tried or these are the meetings that I go to or these are some of the books that I've read or whatever. Um, give it a try and then um, let's talk about it next week and when we have when I have more time and maybe you'll have time. And then over time, as that person looks at other things, they're not so needy anymore and they don't they don't have to keep asking for the same kind of help that they needed in the past. And then it, it gets, it simmers down, it, it, it gets better. So it is helpful to do it that way. And it is coming from a place of love. I like, I like how you said that. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Joanne. That's great. Hannah? 
Uh, yeah, I would like, I wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about the understanding aspect. The understanding aspect, which I, I'm, it may go a different direction this time. We'll see what happens because I, I don't always have the same script on this. Um, the understanding piece is really to be, um, it's almost like having a, it's like having a, um, the way it describes having like radar of your radar of yourself, being aware of your own inner experience, because you're understanding where you are and what you're about. It's a, for example, I'm going to give you an example. Something happens, somebody else says something, and you get upset and you get knocked out of shape. The understanding piece is becoming aware of the fact that that happened. To be on becoming aware, it's like, oh, I see now. When they do that, I get reactive. Let me change that. It's actually different from what I said earlier, just so this is an additive piece. So understanding is almost having a sense of having a roadmap for how you are in life and giving you the freedom to choose a way to be different in the world. So, and I overlap this with responsibility as well, but so understanding in this, this context, though I'm using it now, so let's update it slightly, is being aware of what triggers you, what comes at you and how you choose to respond to it. Because when you understand yourself, you know, I can do something different now. Because the thing about understanding is it's not static. You know, it's like when you know that if a certain person does a certain thing, you're going to react this way, you say, well, you know, I know that. Now I know that. I can change that. So understanding is the key to freedom. In a way, understanding is the next step after after awareness. To become aware of something is great. But when you understand why that happens or how that happens, you can change it. So it's the inner rewiring you can do from that place. Kind of like, um, so I'm understanding it's like a self-study. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. I also like what comes to mind is to thine own self be true, but I can only be true if I come to know and understand. And yep. from there, then I can make better decisions, have better discernment and then be able to do the self-care and then the expression responsibly and health responsibly. and. That's what I'm getting from what you're saying. Yeah, that sounds accurate. And it's funny because I actually had a clubhouse room I was running for a while called To That Own Self Be True. So yes, that is a good, good way of interpreting it. But you can't really be true to yourself until you have a true understanding of yourself, right? You have to go deep to understand yourself. Basically, yeah. And that's the thing people say to that own self be true and have no clue what to do with that. So yeah, it is important to have that internal perspective and a perception of yourself it is a, it is a self reflect self reflect excuse me self reflection process so yeah it's it's the deeper work that most people don't do to be honest although if you're in this room in this um uh, what's the word in this group so the self love revolution group then this is going to be something you're doing anyway because it's giving you a chance to go understanding so what, what did you say the Understanding awareness, choices, action, changes. Yes, Joanne, nicely put. Oh, yeah. And Claudine, passive aggressiveness is a big form of violence that gets swept under the rug. That is the thing about the non-physical the non violence. Yes, it's true. And that's one thing I work with my clients a lot on because that's something they've dealt with a lot in their past relationships. So, absolutely. So, any other thoughts, questions, sarcastic remarks um, before we complete? So, I've got another few minutes left and want to make sure I do finish at the top of the hour, if not before. Sorry, that one I stole from a friend of mine, one of my friends I did a mastermind with. She has that way of putting it where she would say, like, any thoughts, questions, or sarcastic remarks? That's one of her taglines. So, I just stole one from her. Anything else? Any questions, thoughts? Um, oh, quick reminder again, I mentioned forgiveness way back at the beginning of this talk. And if you watch my talk last month, I went into a deep dive on that work with the four, the four horses of the apocalypse, they call them. If you have, if you didn't get the forgiveness practice from back then, if you still want it, just message me. Um, you can post, you send a message over um, Facebook, or if you want to just send me an email to me, my, my email is my name, which is barry at barrysilver.com. So if you want to drop me an email at, at barry at barrysilver.com, you can contact me for that. Um, and also another thing, I mentioned the codependency series I put together called Cracking the Codependency Code. It's for a five-part video series that are like 15 minutes each on my website, which is my name, barryselby.com. 
And as I said before, my website is a 1990s website. It's very old fashioned looking. It doesn't look, it's not really modern. It needs a big revamp. But along the navigation bar is the thing that says cracking the code, dependency code. You can actually tap on that. And the videos are embedded in the page. You can just watch them there without this opt in or anything. So you can get those there too. Um, and that's it. I'm not sure if there's anything else. Any questions? Last thoughts before we sign off? So again, yes, Claudia. Just one thing, it's like about walking away and sometimes it's like, okay, I want to give you something, a tool or, or telling a person I want to give you this tool, you know, sometimes you just have, I mean, I think, and maybe you disagree, sometimes you just have to walk away because it's for your safety, you know, yes. whether somebody is, even if they're not physically violent, but they're just constantly coming back you with verbal abuse because, oh, you won't help me because you don't have this level of friendship with me. You know, like they'll just do all this manipulation. Yes. Like, yeah, just get out of Dodge, you know. Well, that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing about boundaries. Boundaries mean you've got to say no to things. You're going to say, you know, yeah. I need to take care of myself. And that means that I need to remove myself from this circumstance situation so I can be happier and healthier. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And on the, and on the flip side of that, there are sometimes there are some people I know who have such um this high vibes mentality that the boundaries are so sensitive that they walk away from everything versus actually having healthy dialogue yes so it is about being clear about when you're really taking care of yourself and when you're avoiding the truth and that's what i don't like sometimes when people call other people toxic people because i find that's a very pejorative term because you finding them toxic in that moment because they're not giving you what you want probably or they're just in their own nonsense at that time they're going through something and you're not acknowledging that they're going through something they're in pain it's it they have maybe have a toxic situation in their life or a toxicity but that person and you know like you said we're spirits in the human form they're not a, they're not toxic i mean that's right. my opinion yeah well that's true and at the share. same time if it's not your skill set yeah. to help them maybe you would you want to right. walk away just to be, to be healthy too so exactly to that that there are certain words that have been overused in the last few years. Yes. You know, like cancel culture, for example. It's, it's so out <laughs> right. of so it doesn't doesn't mean what people think it means from the way they're using it. Toxicity right. is the same thing. People use the word toxic when right. somebody just is in a bad mood. Exactly. Versus right. that they have real issues they haven't resolved. Exactly. Because some people are dealing with toxicity, especially if they are aware of it, they'll go take help. So that's not toxic because they're doing their work, their results oriented. But if they're living in it and not moving on it, then they can basically get worse and worse. And you, it's better for you to leave them alone. Yes. yes. So it's knowing the difference so you can choose to take care of yourself. Exactly. Because everybody's toxic. You know, everybody, oh, you're dead. They're toxic. Well, <laughs> you know, let, me, like, let, me, let, me, let me let me say another way. Nobody's perfect. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're perfectly imperfect, to put it that way. And and it's great to be that way because if we were perfect, yeah, it'd be so boring, right? <laughs> Basically, yes. <laughs> I mean, as, as spirit, we're perfect. As human, we're imperfect. That's the fun part of being on the planet. We get to That's explore and create and try new things. And experience. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions, thoughts before I wrap up? I thank you all for participating, by the way. And Joanne, I'm, I'm curious to know how things go with you in the next few months with your conversations at work. That's my, things, my, my prayers are with you, I'll put it that way. Okay, um, I get your emails, so I'll respond to one of your emails, and I'll let you know. Okay. How it okay? Absolutely, right. yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd love to thank know because that's that's uh, that's a big choice. Yeah, thank you for your help, and I'm going to do it, and um, I'll keep you posted on how it goes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for all the questions and giving me a chance to go deeper. So I appreciate that a lot. All right. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Then we can wrap up. I thank you for joining us. Appreciate Just being with me. Thank you for me as well. Oh, yeah. you're welcome, Amanda. Thanks for the another questions, keeping you on track. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, so thank you for that. I will. Uh, I'll probably be back in the room. I'm not sure again. I'm not sure if we're doing more of these. Um, Mia keeps pulling me back in again, so I say yes whenever she asks me to. And there'll be other teachers in the room I know during the uh, during this week and next. So thank you for being here. And uh, as always, as a reminder, please take care of yourself. This is part of this journey is learning how to take care of ourselves better and better. And this is my contribution to add to that conversation. And so with that, I thank you for watching and uh, take care of yourself. See you again.